This is a Socialist News and Views special interview. I'm Nick Schillingford coming to you from the Urban Cabin Studios in South Minneapolis with this special interview. You know, on Socialist News and Views, we let folks introduce themselves. Do you want to just let our audience know who you are? Uh, sure. Yeah. Well, thank you, first off, for inviting me uh, onto the show. Definitely excited for the conversation. My name is Ryan Sorrell. I'm the founder and executive editor of the Kansas City Defender. We're a radical black and abolitionist nonprofit digital news and community media organization based in Kansas City, Missouri. We launched just a little bit over three years ago in 2021, really in the aftermath of the 2020 uprisings. I was very involved in the uprisings and I've been organizing probably for the past 10, 10 or so years of my life. And at a certain point, you know, I started a black news outlet when I was in college, but uh, after the 2020 uprisings, it just seemed absolutely necessary, especially in our region and in our city. Uh, our city is, as most cities, I'm sure, primarily dominated by white capitalist imperialist media. And uh, we saw that come to a head during the uprisings. And uh, there's just a very severe lack of uh, not only black news outlets, but black digital news outlets. Uh, and especially Black digital news outlets that can reach uh, young people. And so that's what we aim to do is to be a radical abolitionist Black news outlet that utilizes social media uh, in ways that a lot of local news outlets across the country do not use social media. And so that's enabled us really to, to reach a lot of young people, especially at high school age, college age. Uh, and yeah, I think that's kind of the one other thing I would mention is in addition to uh, journalism and media. We also have an entire second half of our organization called Community Programs, where we have a free clothing program. We uh, have a free grocery program. And we also have done everything from basketball tournaments to open mic nights, political education programming, uh, and a lot more. So that's just kind of the the very quick version. That's fantastic. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, we're, you know, I'm here in Minneapolis, just uh, a couple miles uh, east of George Floyd Square. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Socialist News and Views, our podcast, uh, you know, all we've got so far, we do have a free book table that we get out. Uh, there's a really, really free market that happens. We've been getting out to some Palestine solidarity uh, events and we've been getting out to other events. Um, uh, Nino Costi, Unhoused encampment we got out there at least once um we've been kind of getting around to different things you, you so you and i met at uh socialism 2024 uh i think the session i was trying to remember what the session was called i think it was movement journalism and the fall of legacy media um and you discussed founding kansas city defender uh some of the news stories that you guys have essentially broken or really been on the forefront of um i'm, I'm thinking specifically um you talking about the um revelations of malcolm johnson shooting um and then now i guess i've seen it a little bit in mainstream news what's been dubbed the kc serial killer um can you talk about uh you know that process of founding the kansas city defender and then those two stories specifically um and and, and focusing in on you know the media's mainstream media's kind of complicity in upholding you know certain narratives i think that you know that's kind of what you talked about before can you just talk about a little bit about that uh definitely um, so I think, as you mentioned, uh, and as I also mentioned earlier, I, I founded the Defender in 2021, um, really to be a tool and a vehicle for movement and to be able to amplify movement that was taking place, especially here in Kansas City, but really across our entire state and even across the state of Kansas as well. Uh, just because when I looked around, I, I remember during 2020 specifically, uh, the Trump administration launched uh, an operation. Uh, I think it was called Operation Relentless Pursuit, I believe was the name of it. Uh, it was after a two-year-old Black child got uh, killed here in Kansas City. And so the Trump administration and his justice, so-called Justice Department, 
uh, issued this Operation Relentless Pursuit. And the first part of it was what was called Operation Legend. And uh, basically, that's when they started to send federal agents throughout the country. And so Kansas City was one of the very first places, if not the first place, that they sent these federal agents to. And so we had, we organized a group that I was organizing with at the time. We organized a demonstration and protest uh, outside of our police headquarters, which was also the courthouse is right across the street from it. And uh, there was a, a lot of things that happened, a lot of amazing speeches that were given. And uh, ultimately somebody ended up spray painting the police memorial statue, which, you know, just is what it is. Right. And uh, and the Kansas City Star, uh, which is our largest legacy white news outlet in our area, decided to run a story where they completely ignored everything, all of the context around the entire demonstration. They didn't use excerpts from the speech, from the speeches that were given. They didn't, you know, give context into why it's crazy that federal agents are being sent into our city. Right. And instead they focused the entirety of the story on this inanimate object, a police memorial statue uh, being you know, spray painted. Right. And so to me, that was just like unbelievable. Well, believable, but at the same time, just ridiculous. And yeah, I so remember, I, I was just going to say, I remember seeing, uh, you know, uh, things from uh, independent media about people being snatched off the street in like Portland and stuff like that. I don't remember seeing stuff specifically about Kansas City, but it's like it wasn't getting covered, you know, at all in, uh, you know, really at all in mainstream media. Um, but yeah continue sorry exactly no, i think that's a great point uh people being we had three people in the organization i was in that were basically snatched off of the street threatened with terrorism charges uh that was at the same time that the police were making these fake completely fabricated claims that people were placing bricks on the ground for protests that was kansas city was another place that completely com like state sanctioned disinformation was created was here in kansas city so right. there is there's that story, basically. But there is also, as you mentioned, the story of Malcolm Johnson, who was a black man who was murdered by the Kansas City Police Department in a BP gas station here in Kansas City on a street called Prospect. I believe it was at, I believe, somewhere around 31st in Prospect. I'll have to double check the sure. exact intersection, but um, it's a BP gas station. The police officers basically ambushed him while he was walking in there by himself, and they took him to the ground. They killed him, and the immediate headlines that came out following that story said, basically, man killed after engaging in a shootout with the police. And so I always use this example because when you hear a headline and you hear shootout, of course, any person who hears shootout would think, that that would mean that the person was shooting at the police in order for it to be a shootout. And uh, that was essentially the narrative that lasted for at least a month or two until the employees at the gas station who felt who witnessed this murder happen and felt that it was wrong. I think I might have frozen just a real oh, you're quick. Good. You're good now anyway. Cool, cool. And so the employees of that gas station who felt that uh, this murder was very unjust, they ended up leaking the surveillance footage to uh, the media and uh, to also to some local clergy members. And the local clergy members also shared it with the media. And what we saw and what you can even see, it's on the, these videos, surveillance videos are on YouTube now, actually. And what you see is that Malcolm was actually not armed or at least not actively armed or wielding his weapon right it's questionable if, if he even had a weapon at all but he certainly from the video footage you can tell he was not wielding his weapon and he was actually being pinned on the ground by anywhere between three to three to five police officers who literally had him three to five people pinning him onto the ground arms you know restrained nothing that he could do and one of the police officers accidentally shoots another police officer and then 
ex- shoots Malcolm in the head, ex- executing him from point blank range. Like literally from where I'm sitting right here to the ground, like probably less than three feet away. And uh, so just again, from the very first headlines where we hear that man killed after engaging in a shootout with the police. And even before the surveillance video video was released, these follow-up stories were being conducted, I believe by Fox 4 KC, where they interviewed like a ex FBI agent and asked asked him if the shooting was justified. And this is, again, I, I teach this in classes very frequently when I'm talking about how the media is complicit and actually conspires and covering up these police murders because they interviewed this ex FBI agent who ha- had nothing to do at all. He literally does not know any more than you or I would know about this situation. Right. And he said that the killing was justified. And so they used these so called subject matter experts to further attempt to verify their state sanctioned disinformation. And so when again, when the surveillance footage was released, we could tell all this was a lie, that it was a cover up. Even to this day, that our police department does not acknowledge that they did anything wrong in that situation. Um, and none of the police police officers have been faced any kind of justice whatsoever. So that is one case in and of itself where we can see the media complicity. The second one that you mentioned uh, with the I was just I was just gonna say yeah and we saw this with George Floyd too right that the media here was saying you know it was a medical condition or something like that well there was all kinds of lies and narratives that they tried to spin at the beginning and then more recently I'm thinking the um the NYPD uh you know supposed fair dodger that they went after and then the same kind of thing like it was a shootout you know was, you know there was a video he pulls a knife or whatever but the way they implied like there, there was the shooting going on, but of course the only people shooting <laughs> were the police. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this, ha- you know, this happens over and over again uh, uh, with these narratives that the, 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 the police craft and then the media just runs with like, it's a fact, right? Exactly. And a lot, a lot of people don't even know that the media actually has like these very direct channels of communication with the so-called public information officers at these police departments, like they're friends a lot of times. Mm-hmm. And so the the literal, they're called a public information officer, really is a propaganda like agent for the police department. And these propaganda agents for the police department w- is friends with these journalists and these reporters and these broadcasters. And so anytime a police murder happens, the immediately the propagandists get to work and crafting this completely fake lie that is called uh, official police report. And they craft it into this official police report. They send it out as a so-called press release Mm. to their friends and acquaintances in the media who oftentimes, especially, uh, which is one of the biggest issues that I had with journalism when I first came into journalism was how these media outlets will just accept anything, no matter what it is, they just accept anything that these police departments say as so-called fact. And so I think that gets to this the second story that you were mentioning uh, with the KC serial killer. Uh, his name is Timothy Hazlitt Jr., but it took place in September of 2022. And it was, uh, I believe, like right around September 19th or so. I started to get quite a few people reaching out to us uh, because a lot of black people just in our community are aware of our platform. And so people started to DM us on Instagram, on TikTok, uh, emailing. I had a few phone calls with people who were basically saying that there was a lot of black women who were going missing once again off this same street that I mentioned earlier called Prospect Mm. Avenue, the same street that Malcolm was killed on. Uh, there's a lot of black women who are going missing. And so I talked to various sources to get as much information as possible. And uh, I end up publishing a story basically saying that there people in the community are concerned that there is a potential serial killer. 
I said, we are working to verify as much information as possible. I made very clear we do not trust our police department because we view them to be a criminal terrorist organization. Right. And they have regularly lied. Uh, more lie more frequently than they tell the truth. Right. And so there's no reason why we would ever place our community's safety uh, in the hands of the police department. And so we published, I published the story. I added that disclaimer on there. And I said, as mu as soon as we're able to get more information, we will provide it. And so I, I published that on a Friday and over the weekend, the story just like goes very viral, reaches millions of people. And by that Monday, our police department comes out and says that our reporting was completely unfounded rumors and that there is no basis to support these claims is what they said verbatim. And so once again, the police department puts this out, all of the news outlets, the TV stations, the radio stations, the Atlanta Black Star, Newsweek, every all of the media outlets in the entire city, even these national outlets basically take exactly what the police say they don't they don't come to us and ask us where we got our sources from they don't ask us right. for information they literally just take what the police say which the police sent that out once again in a press release and the the news stations and everybody says basically that we are fake news we're lying we are clickbait we uh are just start trying to start controversy right. and so for like a good two or three weeks uh that was what like basically they complete, tried to completely delegitimize. They The police already didn't like us. The other news outlets already didn't like us. And so my understanding was that this was their chance to just completely delegitimize right. as an organization. And to also, also I think that they were fearful of the fact that we had this kind of information and that we were able to get this kind of information before the police department because that in and of itself also is delegitimizing of the idea that the police department provides safety right. for our community. And so for a good two to three week time span, that's just the narrative. We're kind of like blackballed a little bit. And uh, at that same time, I put out a, an open letter to our community where I say, um, I just list out all the times that our police department has lied and why we should not believe anything that they say ever. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the piece was called like Dear Can Black Kansas City, we got y'all's back, we would not back down or something like that. And then a week later, so three weeks after we published the initial story, uh, a black a twenty one year old black woman from who was in a city called Excelsior Springs, which is about thirty minutes outside of Kansas City, she escapes the basement of this white man who had been holding her captive for uh, a little bit over a month. And uh, somehow she was able to escape while this man was taking his child to school mm. and she escapes and she runs to a neighbor's house, a neighbor of the man. And she's like pleading and knocking on the doors. And uh, finally, I think after like two or three houses, maybe someone answers an older woman and they end up calling the police. The police come and then she tells them everything that she's been going through. And she tells the police that she was kidnapped off of Prospect Avenue, which was the exact same location that we had said in our initial reporting. Right. And she says that she uh, that she was kidnapped in early September, which was also the exact same time period that we said in our initial reporting. So she verified. And then she also says that two of her friends were murdered by this same man, Timothy Hazlitt Jr., who had kidnapped her. And so at that point, and the even crazier also part about this is that when that story first happened, I didn't even see the connection at first, actually. Mm. My understanding was because I was looking at the other news outlets, they were saying woman escapes kidnapping in Excelsior Springs. Mm -hmm. And so it's just like this very isolated story. And um, so I, I actually just like scrolled, like I was like, that sounds terrible, but I just kind of like scrolled past it the first few right. times that I saw that story until the family run news outlet who 
runs the newspaper in Excelsior Springs, who I just happened to be friends with because we were on a panel together a few months before that. One of the owners of that newspaper reaches out to me and says that he thinks that uh, there is a connection between what just happened and the story that we published three, like two to three weeks ago. And I, crazily enough, it was actually his daughter who made the connection. She was only 15 years old and she mm -hmm. was the one who basically made the connection and told him to reach out to me. And so we start to work together. Uh, our news outlet and his family run news outlet in Excelsior Springs called the Excelsior Citizen. And uh, from there, that's when we put out the larger story, making the connection that this woman who escaped was the same one who we had reported on that the police said was a lie. And in that time, that three week time span where the police said it was a lie, we don't know what if she could have been saved, if right. any could have been taken. So again, I think it just goes to speak to once again, the media's complicity in silencing black people, silencing black voices, uh, completely unquestioningly parroting what the police say, no matter how absurd it is. Uh, I think there's just a lot that we can learn from that horrifying situation. Absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, that's a lot of uh, that's a lot of pressure when you have, you know, the police department and you have the uh, city government and all these media outlets coming against you, um, you know, telling you that you're wrong or that you're, you know, uh, so that's really impressive to, uh, to stand up to that. And, you know, especially a newer news outlet and a smaller news outlet to really like, you know, uh, stand your ground and rely on the community and, and the information that you're getting. Um, so I really appreciate that. And that was, uh, um, you know, of course that was really impressive to hear, um, the work that y'all had done on that at, uh, socialism 2024. Um, you know, I read the pointer article, um, I think it's uh, Amaris Castillo wrote in August. Um, and that was, a you know, kind of going over the work that y'all are doing to create a abolitionist newsroom. Um, and I think, you know, in the subtitle, it said at the Kansas City Defender, uh, Ryan Sorrell is following Ida B. Wells and Claudia Jones and honoring the legacy of the radical black press. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I read the uh, book, uh, I think it's uh, to the left of Karl Marx, uh, about Claudia Jones, you know, talking about her history, being in the U.S., being forced to leave the U.S., uh, starting uh, Carnival in uh, the U.K. I was born in the U.K., um, and so that's, you know, that's pretty impressive. You know, that's still something that's that's moving forward. That's something that, uh, you know, she created. Um, I haven't I haven't I haven't uh, read as much on uh, Ida B. Wells. Do you want to just talk about the, you know, the history uh, there, those those two figures, especially? Um and then what it means, you know, to really be an abolitionist uh, newsroom, how that uh, really can set you apart from uh, establishment media. Uh, definitely. Um, I think that the biggest learnings that I have taken from these monumental figures, uh, Ida B. Wells and Claudia Jones, I think with Ida B. Wells, it's really just the unabashed truth telling, regardless of at what cost. Mm. Um, as we know, her newspaper, uh, like printing shop basically was bombed multiple times. Her friends and comrades and uh, colleagues were assassinated uh, and she refused to stop denouncing uh, the lynchings and the terrorism that Black people were going through at that time. She also said things like Black women are, aren't even interested in, uh, because a lot of times like these uh, ma these race massacres and uh, these lynchings were because of so-called Black women attempting to make sexual advances towards white women. And uh, Ida B. Wells even like literally says Black women are not even interested in that at the time. Mm. And so that's, of course, you know, saying something like that is, you know, unheard of at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think just that ethos for me, for Claudia Jones, I think very similar. Um, she was a monumental figure in the communist movement. She uh, 
also when when I came into because I I don't have any formal journalistic background. I never went to journalism school. I good. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I I came into this like very against the idea of journalism because I also think back to when I when I first came into journalism, I was like l- trying to understand the field because I just like saw so many lies mm. in, from these white news outlets, from these uh, colonial news outlets, imperialist news media. And so I just saw so many lies and I was like, where is this coming from? Who is teaching like that so-called uh, objectivity? It should be a journalistic. Right. Camp. And I'm just confused. And I'm <laughs> and so I just like am trying to read everything I can. So I go and I, I research the first white American news outlet which was the Boston news outlet, uh, the Boston newsletter. And uh, within one month of their founding, they had already built their business model, revenue model around uh, selling enslaved black people. And Mm. they were the first broker in the first broker ever, not just slave broker, but the first broker ever in American history. And it was a newspaper that, enabled for the expansion, the mass expansion of slavery in the United States to expand to the in the massive way that it did. It was an actual newspaper. So what that told me was that the that racism, dehumanization, anti-blackness, white supremacy were all interconnected uh, with the literal founding of white journalism in the United States. And so I knew that that was not something that I wanted any part of at all. And so I've always kind of pushed away from the idea of journalism, but Claudia Jones actually embraced the idea of being a journalist. And she was very proudly in her journals, she would write that she was a journalist. And so that also, that made me reflect and think on, uh, can I actually be a journalist or Mm -hmm. are there? Are there people like her who actually represent what journalism is? Or maybe we just have, you know, maybe there's uh, radical black journalism and then there's just white imperialist journalism. And so it just made me think a lot more deeply about how I even self-identify. Um, and I think one other piece was uh, researching the very first black news outlets as well to understand the history of the radical black press. And what I found there was that the first uh, black newspaper in American history called Freedom's Journal uh, was an abolitionist newspaper. It was founded in a church. They were very, they very clearly were not objective at (laughs) all. Right. And uh, yeah, so I, I think just, going back and actually learning it was very liberating for me and it made it so that when we when we do get into these situations where these news outlets or police try to say we're being biased or we're lying or anything like that i can be i can just say so (laughs) right right yeah we are biased absolutely exactly oh uh yeah i think those that all just kind of helped uh me get to philosophically and and practice to the place that we're at yeah, I really, you know, I push against that, you know, uh, uh, unbiased or whatever, you know, number one, because it's impossible because there's nobody that's unbiased or, uh, you know, there's no objectivity, uh, you know, clearly like these, these, um, you know, these news outlets rely on the system we have right now. They rely on advertisers and things like that to function. So, you know, they're not going to put in, you know, they're going to be very wary at least about putting in anything that uh ostracizes their advertisers which again is you know is feeding off of the system of capitalism and imperialism um i think it was interesting one of the one of the quotes um i think it i thought it was from um her trial uh for being un-american or whatever claudia jones um but i think i was looking it up and i think it might have been in a letter and it said something it said um actually i have it here it said uh 
but no law or decree can whittle away or pierce by one iota our convictions and loyalty to America's democratic and revolutionary traditions. We are Americans, each and every one of us, similarly perse persecuted, not by accident of birth, but by choice. We yield to no one in laying claim to being true patriots. Um, and I thought that was kind of interesting, like you said, with the journalism piece that, uh, you know, like, instead of like shying away from certain labels or whatever, which is kind of doubling down on, on no, I'm the patriot. You know, there's a revolutionary tradition here um, of people in the United States, and I stand with that tradition, and I stand against, uh, you know, your tradition. Um, yeah, I think that, you know, I think that's really impressive, and it's, it you know, it can be so difficult. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of even, uh, you know, independent media can sometimes, you know, bend to that pressure, um, because again, it's a lot of pressure, so if you don't have you know, a center, you know, and again, that, that comes from the, you know, uh, not being, not seeing yourself as objective, but seeing yourself as centered in like, you know, like you said, like this idea of, uh, being an abolitionist or, um, you know, being black radical newspaper. I think, you know, if you don't have that center, then you can get pushed all over the place by, uh, the powers that be. So I'm, you know, I was really excited to, to learn about the Kansas city defender. I, I think I had seen some of your articles before, but I wasn't super familiar before um, socialism 2024 with the, uh, with the history there and with your organizing. And so um, my main, fo my main focus in uh, Kansas city before had been like the Casey tenants union stuff that I've been seeing, which was really impressive. Um, but yeah, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of important stuff going on down there. And so I really appreciate uh, you taking the time to chat with me um because i know you're uh busy is there anything else that you want to share about uh you know the work that y'all are doing or anything else that's going on uh before you go uh i think that was probably mostly i definitely want to shout out casey tenets who uh officially now uh i believe they're in day 21 of the rent strike nice. that's yeah. ongoing it's the longest and the largest rent strike in kansas city history um, so they're just doing incredible work and also decarcerate KC. Uh, they're another abolitionist, uh, grassroots power building organization in Kansas city that we work pretty closely with. They are, uh, helping stop the jail construction. Uh, just recently our city council, uh, signaled that they're planning to build an $800 million jail at the same time that our pub public school uh, our public school system is seeking about $777 million to upgrade their facilities that are literally like the HVAC systems are failing. Uh, there's bad air circulating through the buildings. The buildings are crumbling and like a very close amount of money that it would take to upgrade all of the schools in our school system. They're instead going to take and build an $800 million jail. And so Decarcerate KC is doing uh, uh, incredible work, uh, as well as many, many, many other organizations in the city. I think it is uh, an exciting time to be in movement work here in Kansas City. And I think the last thing I, as far as media is concerned, is uh, that I forgot to mention is that I just truly cannot take any of these establishment media corporatist, colonial, capitalist, imperialist media serious at all uh, because of how they are reporting on the genocide taking place in Palestine. We've just seen time and time again the most disgusting and absurd, uh, horrifying and uh, flat out lies that they have been uh, telling about the genocide, both in Gaza and now in Lebanon and uh, I just I, I can't imagine that any of the people who work at these places or that are engaging in a lot of this uh, who are actually complicit in the genocide itself uh, I, I don't know how they have anything to say about journalism or media and so that is just something I have more recently been reflecting on yeah, I think a lot of people are uh, are seeing that. I mean, if they're not, they're, you know, they're lost in the propaganda because so many people are just seeing like so clearly laid bare, like how, again, like you said, 
how complicit the mainstream media outlets are in the whole, uh, you know, as, as, uh, 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 as Noam Chomsky said, manufacturing consent, right. You know, that they'll do anything. They'll go to any lengths to try to like create this again, narrative that is obviously to anybody that has eyes is complete BS, but they'll still keep going at it. Like, uh, like it's reality until, uh, you know, they hammer it into some people's heads, but well, I really appreciate your time. And, uh, I really, again, I really appreciate everything that's going on in, uh, Kansas city. Uh, there's so much amazing work and, uh, you know, I can't even cover everything that y'all are doing. So, uh, thanks so much for your time. And I appreciate it. And that's our special interview. Thanks so much for listening. Solidarity. This has been a Socialist News and Views special interview.